All bets are off. Or are they? It was an un unsettled legal uh, issue. A judge calls it fiction, online, but illegal. The state's multi-billion dollar gaming agreement in limbo. I know our community. New commissioners, familiar faces. And I am humbled uh, by this opportunity the governor has afforded me. Broward's new double dose of leaders. You can buy consultants, you can buy good attorneys, you can't buy wildlife. Who gets to keep the green? Money can incentivize people to make decisions for instant gratification that lead to long-term disaster. Old golf course, new homes. The most worrisome variant that we have seen so far. And the newest COVID variant on the move. What do we know? It's all live this week in South Florida. Good morning, I'm Glenna Milberg. Michael is off this morning. Great to be with you on this holiday weekend. And we begin with a game of chance. In a one-two punch of court rulings this week, a federal judge ruled the Seminole Tribe's new online sports betting is illegal. That although the servers processing the internet bets are on tribe property, the gamblers themselves must be too. The online sports book is the centerpiece of the governor's renewed gaming compact with the tribe worth an initial $2.5 billion to the state. The judge called the setup fiction and ended the compact, but the tribe is still operating that gambling act. Daniel Wallach is a gaming law and sports betting attorney who has followed the cases since day one, even calling this outcome last spring, even before lawmakers approved that deal. Daniel, great to have you with us today on the program. Lena, thank you for having me on, and you are correct. Not only was I the first to call it, but to this point, right before the decision, the only one to call it. All right, so, so, so let's start it, there. Let, let's do that. What did you see last spring that apparently no one else either saw or chose to see? Well, it comes down to a, an interpretation of the, of the statutory language in the statute. It's clear I use my, my background and experience and lens as an appellate lawyer litigating hundreds of those cases. So I bring interpretive tools to the equation here. And the federal statute, which governs gambling on Indian land, says in numerous places that it only covers gaming activity on Indian land. And the United States Supreme Court said, and nowhere else. So every reasoned interpretation of the statute, even case law uh, that has addressed the scope or interplay of internet wagering with IGRA has made crystal clear that the location of the better is what determines where the gaming activity takes place. Okay, so IGRA, the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, which governs tribal gaming across the country on all tribal lands, written and approved late 70s, early 80s, there was no internet then. So as this appears to be a precedent setting case, does that make a difference here going forward? No, no, no not at all. IGRA was actually enacted in 1988. And the, it, it's not a matter of the statute being obsolete. It's the territorial limitations of the statute, which make clear it defines it within IGRA that Indian land means the Indian reservation, or after acquired trust property. Uh, the whole point of this statute was to give Indian tribes the ability to conduct class three gaming on their own lands. Once you go off the reservation, then it's no longer Indian lands. And then the tribes, if they wish to, could be treated like commercial operators getting licenses in other states. And you see states like Connecticut, Michigan and Arizona create a regime in which the compact allows on reservation sports books, and then the tribes have to get licenses like other commercial operators in order to operate online sports betting. The tribes in those three states saw the wisdom of that, of that you know, approach because it's the only one that passes legal muster. So the statute as written makes crystal clear that it only covers the Indian territory and Congress has recognized that the statute is limited to gaming on Indian lands because a number of congressmen have introduced bills over the past two years to allow tribes to operate in person, or I'm sorry, online sports betting under IGRA. That's a tacit admission that the legislation from the, from the late 1980s doesn't go as far as the Seminole tribe in the state of Florida would like it to today. So I, I wanna just stay on this whole um, internet, new internet, unprecedented, online component to this because the judge called it fiction. Even the governor, Ron DeSantis, said 
uh, Tuesday when he sort of answered questions without having seen the ruling. Um, he had mentioned that he knew that it was legally uh, fishy, that it was not crystal clear that this was going to be legal. Yet what the governor said was he went ahead and approved it <clears throat> because he thought that if it went to a referendum, which it might, which we can talk about, if it went to a, a referendum that the voters would likely approve it anyway. That's what he said. Well, geez, you know, he's talking out of both sides of his mouth here. You know, when we go back to April, May, and June, when the legislation was considered and enacted, he showed no, uh, you know, equivocal, um, you know, concerns about whether this would pass muster. He only said that we will defend it to the hilt. The, the concerns were expressed by certain lawmakers, but those concerns were drowned out by messaging from the governor's office and from the Seminole Tribe of Florida. There was a total failure of due diligence here in both the governor's office and on the back of the state legislature, which had a duty to vet this properly, legally, and they never did because Governor DeSantis uh, issued a number of you know, messages through you know, summaries and legislative leaders made it crystal clear to the lawmakers that this was gonna pass muster legally. I never heard one iota of concern from the governor back in April, May, or June. So this is sort of like selective uh, and wishful memory. It just never happened. Let me, let me ask you about uh, an enforcement, a federal enforcement act that I read about, and I wonder if this applies or doesn't. Um, the IUGEA Unlawful Internet Gambling Enforcement Act, which does not make this sports booking online legal or illegal, doesn't even address the legality of it, but what it does make illegal is the wire transfer of the bet from the individual better to the company receiving it. So it's, it's like a, a bank wire law. Does that apply here either way? Yeah, well, I've heard of IGRA. I'm sorry, I've heard of UE. That's the UEGA statute. I'm a gaming lawyer. That's certainly one of a whole host of federal laws that the tribe may or actually are violating. But more importantly, because an online sports book is dependent upon partnerships with commercial vendors, uh, you know, uh, payment processors, geolocation technology providers, the tribe have to, have to partner with no, a number of non-tribal entities. And those companies are certainly violating uh, a whole host of state and federal laws. I mean, the, the, the opinion from Judge Friedrich makes clear that uh, online sports betting conducted uh, via a compact violates federal law. And she not just severed the compact, she invalidated the entire thing. So every wager going forward, and even arguably every wager dating back to November 1st, when the tribe launched its digital sports book, is in violation of federal law. And any companies that aid, assist, and abet those operations themselves are violating federal gambling laws. And they could be putting their gambling licenses in other states in jeopardy. Why? is the rest of the compact now invalidated as well? Because there were, we haven't talked about the other things that were in this renewed compact, like uh, granting the Seminole tribe the ability to do table games like, um, like blackjack, like roulette. Why would this online portion affect the rest of it? Because the Seminole tribe made no effort to defend the rest of the compact in federal court. Their only purpose in intervening in the D District of Columbia federal court lawsuit was to argue that they should have been named in the lawsuit. And even if they had been named, they're immune from litigation under sovereign immunity. So it was one of those classic gotcha arguments. You should have named us, but you can't name us. And there was no attempt for the tribe to create or, or, or argue the merits of the compact. They had every opportunity to intervene for the purpose of filing a brief or maybe filing an amicus brief. They went all in on this motion to dismiss on sovereign immunity grounds that they waived the argument surrounding the rest of the compact and the Department of Justice did not argue any of the other elements of the compact being, uh, you know, being permissible. And under District of Columbia federal case law, there's a case known as Amador County. It gives the court the ability to strike the entire compact if part of it is invalid. Yeah. So it's a blunder by the tribe and by the U.S. Department of Justice. But this is the tribe's compact. It's the state of Florida's compact. It was incumbent upon those two entities to defend the compact on the ground of, uh, you know, the server location being where the bet takes place, which would have been a false city anyway. Yeah. But they could have at least briefed 
the issue of the rest of the compact and they abandoned that. Yeah, they actually, and neither of those parties was a party to this lawsuit. Oh, Daniel Wallace, it, I have a, a couple more they questions for you. Can, can we take a quick break and we'll come right yeah. back in a couple of minutes. All right, stay tuned. We are back with gaming law sports booking attorney Daniel Wallach on the ruling against the online betting for the Seminole tribe this week. Um, uh, we were talking about how neither the governor, the state, nor the tribe was party to these lawsuits, Daniel. And in fact, it was brought by Magic City Casino in Miami, another casino in Bonita Springs, against the federal government, the Department of Interior that oversees IGRA for sort of approving, even tacitly approving, and letting this slide and take place. So now that it has been twice ruled illegal, it is still operating. The app is still up, it's still running, and people can still place bets. What gives? What happens there? Well, the tribe uh, should have known very well that the decision uh, removed its ability to legally operate sports betting. So they're basically talking out of both sides of their mouth there operating online sports betting in violation of a federal court ruling and now they're turning to the uh, to the dc circuit court of appeals and saying they're going to be irreparably harmed if they can't operate sports betting they've asked for a ruling from the appellate court to stay the effect of judge frederick's order so that they can continue to operate online sports betting but their actions in jumping the gun and continuing to operate in flagrant violation of a federal court ruling undermines their uh, claim of irreparable harm and actually uh, makes them look uh, like bad actors in front of the appellate court. And there's a principle in the law that one who seeks equity, which is what a stay pending appeal involves, equitable relief, one who seeks equity must come to court with clean hands and by operating an illegal digital sports book in violation of a court order, the Seminole tribe's hands are far from clean. That in and of itself may uh, forfeit its entitlement to stay relief, but they're gonna lose on the merits of that anyway. And at some point soon, they will have to shut down their online sports book either because they recognize it's the wise thing to do, or they will be ordered to do so by a federal court. But it barring being ordered to do so, well, does, doesn't this opinion sort of order them to do so and where forgive if this is an obvious question but where do the consequences come from for a sovereign nation well to the extent they're uh operating as criminal felons off indian lands they're not exactly uh covered by sovereign immunity and certainly their vendors are not covered by sovereign immunity to the extent that they're participating in illegal activities. I mean, there's a long line of case law that, uh, you know, that stand for the proposition that the U.S. Department of Justice can seek injunctive relief against the Indian tribes that conduct illegal class three gaming. Uh, the federal court is not without powers here. And let's make no mistake, the tribe and the state of Florida are not, you know, innocent, passive observers here. Uh, the state of Florida filed uh, an amicus curiae brief and the tribe is the party appealing the lower court ruling and sought intervention. Yeah. So they're involved in the lawsuit. And whether the judge can enter, uh, you know, civil contempt remedies right now, uh, that, that might be an open question, but there's no ambiguity about the court ruling indicating that the conduct of, of online sports betting is no longer legal under federal law, nor is it even legal under state law because the state law is what approved the compact. There is no independent basis under state law under which to operate uh, online sports betting from tribal land. That issue is governed by federal law. And if anybody thinks that the tribe can act with impunity here in perpetuity, oh, I gotta tell you, this is not like the, the issue years ago where they ignored a Florida Supreme Court ruling and continued to operate blackjack at their reservation in violation of a court order. Yeah. We are now in the land of e-commerce and interstate commerce. Yeah. And so, there are, are a number of companies so that are placing themselves at great jeopardy. Understood. Um, in, the, in the minute that we have left, uh, they've made, the Seminole Tribe has made under the compact two payments to the state in uh, October and in November. Another one is due December 15th. Uh, quickly, do you know what happens with those payments and the ones to come? Uh, the state could probably claw it back 
if the uh, appeal or the decision of Judge Frederick is affirmed, because then the compact never came into being. But there are a number of other questions about clawing back payments. What about all the betters that made losing bets during the uh, intervening period of time in which the compact was, was, was in operation illegally? There are a number of legal questions that are caused by the fact that the Seminole tribe did not wait for a court ruling to launch their sports book. They were supposed to wait and they represented to the parties in the litigation that they would wait for a court ruling before launching. So by jumping the gun, uh, the Seminole tribe themselves have created all these adverse uh, consequences, which are largely of their own making. Daniel Wallach, sports betting attorney, thank you for this. Uh, I feel like I was in a law school class today, really enlightening. Worth it to say that we have invited repeatedly someone from the tribe to be with us. We hope that does happen soon. Uh, thanks for being with us. My pleasure, Glenda. You get an A-plus for the question. <laughs> thank you, sir. All right, next, the governor's choice. Broward County is about to get two new commissioners. Familiar faces in new roles, and one of them is here next. The recent primaries to fill the late Alcee Hastings seat in Congress left some gaping holes in other places because of those who resigned to become candidates. Three are in the state legislature, two were on the Broward County Commission until the governor filled them this week. As a kid who grew up right here in the district, attended public schools in the district, a proud resident of the district, and a fourth generation member of the New Mile of Baptist Church, I know our community, I know our issues, and I'll be a strong voice on the county commission. That is Tori Alston, who will be succeeding Dale Holness in the District 9 seat on the Broward Commission. He is currently Chief of Staff at the Florida Department of Transportation, and he promises to be with us very soon, so we look forward to that. And here live with us today, Jared Moskowitz, who will succeed Barbara Sharif in the District 8 seat. So good to see you. I feel like every time we're together, you have a new role to play. Oh, good morning, Glenna. <laughs> uh, yeah, let's... Let's hope this role is a lot less eventful than what I did for the previous two and a half years. You, you know, what I was going to say is last time the governor appointed you to something, we all called you the master of disaster. And so, you know, hopefully that won't be this this time. So is this um, did you ask for this? How did this happen? Sure. I'm you know, when I was in Tallahassee, I was serving away from my family. You know, my my wife and my young kids stayed in, in Broward County uh, and during, uh, you know, the term of of you know, being the director of emergency management, the pandemic hit and I didn't go home for a long period of time. I spent a lot of time away from them. Uh, and then unfortunately, my dad fell ill during the pandemic. And so I, you know, told the governor that, you know, it was time for me to go home and be with be with my family. And we always kind of discussed in the abstract that, you know, look, there could be an opportunity, you know, sometime in the future to continue my service at home. I mean, I was a city commissioner for six years, the state house for six years. Uh, and so, you know, when these seats came available, it was just mutual discussions between myself and the governor's office. And so um, you will take your place on the commission along with Tori Alston in January. You know, last weekend we had the new mayor, Michael Udine was here. I know you worked with him when you were a commissioner in Parkland. He was mayor in Parkland. Uh, so I was he talked a little bit about what his vision was and his priorities as the new commission takes shape. What are yours? Well, listen, I think we share some of the same priorities, obviously, uh, with the uh, Biden administration and Congress finally passing the infrastructure bill. That's there's a huge opportunity there for Broward County. We got to work with our friends uh, in the legislature and the administration, to try to get Broward's fair share uh, of those dollars. You know, I'm, I remain obviously very concerned uh, about the pandemic and Omicron. Obviously, I have unfortunately a lot of experience with that. So Broward needs to remain vigilant and make sure we're serving our residents uh, during the pandemic. Uh, Health care access was something that I learned a lot about during the pandemic. You can make it affordable, but if they don't have access to it, they're not educated about it. Transportation to health care is a huge issue. So that's stuff I, I want to work on. And then I'm worried about a lot of families that have been uh, affected by the pandemic, left behind economically uh, because of the pandemic. So those are the things that I'm going to focus on on the commission. The pandemic is, was, and currently will be so much of a topic for all of us. Um, I want to I want to just let you know that I think you know, we all sort of keyed in on who you were when you were in the state legislature after the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas murders. Uh, that was your district. You're very close to that. And you gave um, a heart-wrenching floor speech 
that riveted your colleagues. And I am going to say an observation was that you, that floor speech sort of got your very divided colleagues to pass what was unprecedented gun safety legislation in the state then. I wonder now that you're coming back to the Broward Commission and you have a closer now observation of school safety and where it's come in the last three years, what do you, what is your thoughts and observations on that progress? Look, I think we've made tremendous progress. Uh, you know, obviously uh, that work is never finished. I think there's a lot more the Broward County Commission working with our partners at the school board can continue to do to make sure our kids uh, are safe uh, at school. Uh, obviously, the, the, the memories of uh, February 14th are still with me and vivid. I still keep in touch with a lot of the, the, the families. Um, and look, those what happened that day is permanent. Uh, and, um, you know, there are still empty chairs and empty tables. There are still graduations that didn't take place, weddings that will never happen. Those families' struggles uh, should be the lessons to everybody else that this is not something that we just put a check mark in a box and say, okay, we did that, we're finished. Uh, this is something that we have to look at every year uh, and continue to make changes and tweaks to make sure our kids are safe. And so I did that when I was in the legislature, uh, obviously getting uh, a Republican House, a Republican Senate, the Republican governor to sign gun safety, which is we're the only state in the country that's done that. Washington hasn't done that. Uh, and then we've the legislature's gone back year after year and looked at it. And so I, I plan to continue to try to do that at the commission. And I think there's a lot of great partners at the commission at the school board who are trying to do that as well. So I look forward to joining that conversation. Yeah, that, that, let me segue, that brings up what I think is a real lesson that your trajectory in the last decade has shown not only South Florida, but really a lesson nationally. You were chosen to head the Department of Emergency Management by a very conservative governor in a Republican-led state as a Democrat and a fairly progressive one at that. And you are, well, there's no one that doesn't like you. There's no one that doesn't think you're doing a great job. He chose you again. How do you teach other people in this divided state and nation to, to do work and get along as possible political adversaries, but not enemies? How, how is that master class going to be taught by Jared Moskowitz? Yeah, well, unfortunately, Glenna, right now, there's just so much money in division. Uh, and it's pumped into everybody's brain every day on television, online. Uh, and people should understand there, there are folks making money off of you to make you angry uh, and to divide you. I mean, the idea that if a Democrat works with a Republican or a Republican works with a Democrat, somehow they're a traitor. Listen, I've been very true to my principles. I've never given up any of my principles. I think Republicans are wrong on uh, lots of topics, many in fact, but I just don't look at them as the enemy. Uh, and I think that uh, this idea that we can disagree, but we also have to be disagreeable, um, you know, that that's something that's been said to us. It's just it's magnified online um, and it's and elected officials have have played a part in it because what they realize is that if they go along with the division. They can rise within their own party because that's where the energy is. There's no money or energy in you know, let's cooperate. But you know what? You want to be successful in business. To be successful in business, you got to find compromise. There's no businessman out there that's been successful by saying, I'm not going to work with 50% of the other businesses. Uh, no, it's all about compromise. And so, you know, the, my, my fear is, is that no matter what class I could teach on that, people aren't going to listen because they're going to take the easy route, the cheap route, which is just to be partisan. By the way, it takes no skill to be partisan, FYI. It's easy. Telling people what they want to hear is easy. Telling people that we got to find common ground, we got to work together, you know, we, we're, we're going to give on this issue, but we're going to get this issue. That's, that's hard. Uh, and it takes patience. Um, and so, you know, look, we're in, a, we're in a very terrible time in politics, in my opinion. It's not getting better. It's getting worse. I thought maybe, you know, Joe Biden being a pretty moderate guy, likable guy, friends on both sides, that we might get, we might snap back a little bit. And we, we haven't. We have not snapped back. And so, uh, you know, I fear for a lot of people who, you know, want to get into politics for the wrong reasons these days. It doesn't seem we're electing, uh, you know, folks to Congress uh, that we used to. We're, we're, we're electing lesser men and women uh, who are not getting there to do uh, policy and you know, make change to help people's lives to like 
you know, make people better to, to close the gaps economically. No, we're electing people that want to get Twitter famous and get on television. Speaking of Twitter, I may just clip that answer, put it on Twitter, and I hope a lot of other people will too, because that was a master class on this Thanksgiving, a beautiful message and a heartfelt one. We so look forward to covering you and Tori Alston and the former commissioners and new commissioners, and um, we wish you the best of luck. Thanks so much, Jared. Thanks, Glenn. I hope you had a happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Same. A long battle for the former Calusa golf course is a South Florida story pitting urban sprawl with quality of life. The end came this weekend, or did it? That's next. A deadline passed this weekend for Miami-Dade's mayor to veto a decision by commissioners to allow a residential home builder to develop what neighbors call a wildlife sanctuary into another housing development. The years-long saga of the former Calusa golf course is a South Florida story, really, pitting urban sprawl with quality of life. The 10-2 vote for the developer came despite a passionate outcry, petitions, and thousands of letters. And that overwhelming vote signaled that would it be enough to override any veto anyway. Neither mayor nor district commissioner for that uh, piece of land was available to be with us today. And the people at GL Homes, the developer, did not respond to our invitations. You know who did? Sally Heyman, one of the two commissioners who voted no and is here to talk about it. Commissioner, great to see you. Thanks for being on the program. Glenna, for you anytime. <laughs> I'm going to hold you to that. Okay, so let's well, start with, let's start with what, what was behind the no vote? Well, Glenna, you know my uh, district. Uh, about two decades ago, I had the same type of dilemma with the Williams Island golf course uh, that closed down, privately owned, and no one wanted to buy it. The neighborhood only wanted a golf course, but they couldn't come up with the money. The county didn't want to come up with the money, and no one else wanted to uh, resolve it into a public use park. Uh, so it could continue its uh, green space. So I sort of had. Them. And when they said they would like to keep it as a golf course, I supported that, you know, initially, but no one stepped up, including the county. So the reality was, is, was it was going to end up like Williams Island for uh, uh, years and years. It uh, began somewhat of a wasteland and uh, it became a problem for public safety, homeless, trespass, animals, um, ATVs at all times of the night, etc. And the people kept complaining. But, you know, it's a disservice. So In let me, case, um, Commissioner, let me just, let me interrupt you. Just said, I, I just want to break the covenant. I, I just want, before you continue, forgive for interrupting. I know a Zoom conversation is really tough to have, but I want to understand in, in the case, you live this in your district, as you're explaining, but if nobody steps up to do the parkland and no one can pay for reviving a golf course, what what's left but to give the people who own the property the right to do the development? I agree. And that's what happened at Williams Island, but it really was negotiated. I forgot the name of it. It's Aventura States or something like that. Uh, but uh, here's the reality, Glenna. Um, when they said that they would look to preserving green space, be respectful, that they just want to break a 99-year golf course covenant, it was like, okay, but be mindful of who's going to be there uh, living there that depended on that covenant when they looked at land use to live there, a green passive area, no longer a golf course. So I was open-minded for that. They actually said they would consider uh, uh, a state homes, which is one home, one single family home for five acres. So that made it under 35 homes. That's a reality. And I remember that, and it was a couple years ago, and someone else reminded me, that's what I said. And you know something, there's a hell of a difference between less than 35 homes or up to 35 homes and 550 homes. 
Yeah, I and love well, the let, idea, me just, uh, let me just let me just tell you. Let me just um, put on the record for people who aren't following this this closely is that the developer had, um, I, I don't want to use the word threatened because I don't mean to be that editorial. Certainly there are two sides to every story, but uh, that a thou more than a thousand homes might have gone there. Um, uh, again, I wish we had the developer here to answer to some of this, but I, I think what the focus of the commission vote, at least what made the public uh, really riveting, rivet on this, is the fact that there might be this wildlife sanctuary with endangered species there, and you had, you know, the, the county's Ron McGill, who is the spokesperson for the zoo, who is probably the most passionate ad animal advocate the public knows here. Um, and the county didn't listen to his pleas about at least taking a step back and looking at how to protect the wildlife, which the mayor in her non-veto message last night yeah. uh, assures that she will hold the county to do. But, but why not wait? What was the decision? Why not just to do some due diligence on that wildlife? Hey, that's my concern, uh, Glenna. Uh, we heard the threat, 1100 potential for 1100 uh, homes, okay? And they said, but hey, we're only doing 550. Well, that's what they came back with negotiated i think it could have been negotiated and and, and the mayor is, is very concerned about the environment i read about the birds the bats and i love that is uh, within the udb but you know something negotiated from a beautiful uh described uh, landscape uh, uh 550 home community center and everything else bring it down uh for the other people that really bought into but for the surrounding area, because you are breaking a long time beyond anyone's life, 99 year covenant. The, the covenant and, that was um, broken was I done so that's with- what should have been done when you said uh, waiting. Yeah, the covenant that- I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, I just want to um, like bring the audience in and say we are having sort of some audio problems, so apologize for that. But in this time of COVID, we do things by Zoom. So everyone, thanks for just kind of sticking with this. Um, Commissioner Heyman, I, I just want to ask you one last question that's kind of a big picture question when it comes to development versus screen space. And you brought up the urban development boundary where Right now, no development can go past unless it's moved, and that's always a question. But at one, at some point, you've been a commissioner such a long time in Miami-Dade. You know Miami-Dade County better than so many people. Does there come a time when Miami-Dade and Broward and Monroe just says, enough's enough. We have no more room. Developers find a, another way to build, but we can't give up any more land. D does that ever, do you think that will ever come to pass? You know, I, I can't say the possibilities are out there, but in my district, when we ran out of land, we went up, uh, uh, up in the air, multiple uh, uh, floors, uh, some 30, 40 uh, floors, but they have an incredible view with parks around them and the ocean. Uh, the biggest concern is it was in the UDB, and I was happy that they have the right to develop it but I honestly believe it could have been brought down some. It's a beautiful development, and I think they're gonna be environmentally sensitive, but you know something? Uh, we have that up in Grenells Park, and uh, it, it sort of destroyed the Avery and uh, the Rookery, if you will. Um, so let's, let's see what happens, but uh, this was a covenant, and I think it should have been negotiated from 550 homes down. Um, and give the people who bought into the area surrounding it and didn't settle for uh, private dollars um, a chance to stay in a, a majority greenish area uh, yeah. and passive use area in a residential area. So that was my no vote. Yeah. Uh, you know, I wanted to stay to more of uh, a residential, but not so compact. Understood. Not 550 squishing in around the rookery. Understood. Commissioner Sally Heyman, also Commissioner Joe Martinez was the other no vote in that two to 10 vote. Commissioner, so great to have you this morning and thanks for um, sticking with us through all these technical problems. Appreciate your time always. Stay well, Glenda, and to everybody, be safe, happy holidays. Thanks.
Up next, deja vu all over again. Travel restrictions now underway. So are the questions about the newest COVID variant identified in South Africa. Some answers, hopefully, about Omicron next. We end this holiday weekend with the beginnings of preparing for another developing COVID variant. B.1.1529 got its Greek letter designation Omicron, identified in South Africa. Now cases in Europe and Israel have travel restrictions underway, including some in the United States. South Florida, always the gateway to the world, now on alert. Experts are scrambling to learn more about the variant, including Dr. Dushantha Jayawira. He is an infectious disease expert at the University of Miami. Doctor, great to have you on the program today. Thank you. Nice to be here. Thank so you for inviting me. Have, um, have you been privy to any cases in the United States just yet? No, at this moment, the CDC and the NIH is stating that there is there are no cases, but we are beginning to test people uh, going forward to make sure that there is surveillance. So it, it, at this point, there's nothing. Else. When you say test people going forward, practically speaking, what does that look like? Are you testing travelers? Are you doing uh, test cases randomly? What is the practical effects of so, that? So the practical thing would be when people are, uh, get tested for COVID, that sample can be sequenced to find whether this variant is, uh, is present. So uh, the good thing is that when the rates go down, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the number of possibilities go down. So one thing we have to remember is that the virus is constantly mutated. The variants emerge, variants disappear. And so this is something to be expected. And, uh, and what, we, what we should do is to wear a mask and vaccinate because those two will decrease the number of variants appearing in the United States. So that these are the two really important things. Yeah, I feel like we've been talking about that for a year and a half from the very beginning of COVID. And then every time we see a new variant emerge, the story, the advice is very similar. Wear masks, the social distancing. Now, of course, we have vaccines. Is it, I, I'm, I'm thinking it's too soon to know, but do scientists know how long it'll take to figure out whether the vaccines that are, are now being deployed do have some sort of effect on, on Omicron? At this moment, the data is that the vaccines work against Omicron. I mean, the, the data is very limited. Uh, the, uh, the way the WHO has classified Omicron as a variant of concern, the variant of concern is that there may be slight diminution of the activity, but this can be overcome uh, by wearing masks. So I don't think that there is hard evidence to say that there is real concern that the vaccine will not work. Well, that's certainly promising news. So right now it seems like it is a travel issue at this point. Um, there were reports today that there were 61 people on one flight from South Africa to the Netherlands who have tested positive and some of them doctor tested positive for Omicron and also one of the other COVID variants. Um, I'm not sure we've heard a simultaneous infection. What is? What are the chances of that? Does that does that make sense to you? Yeah, because uh, Omicron is just. I mean, you, you know, you can have a Delta and then have a, another mutation and transform into Omicron. So uh, that is nothing unusual. I mean, this evolution of the virus in it's you know it's a simple survival mode of the virus. So virus keeps mutating to survive and we keep developing vaccine to block it. So it is expected, uh, but it doesn't mean that this is a more severe virus than uh, Delta. Uh, at this moment, we don't know. I mean, the latest information from South Africa is that it is not that severe. So that again, the adaptation of the virus for survival, because if it's very severe, then the chance of survival is less for the virus. So the virus tries to keep going. And what they try to do is to increase their replication capacity so that they can replicate faster and also increase the infectivity. So that doesn't mean that the, the, the patients are, have a severe disease. Well, if the reports from South Africa are that it is not that severe, I guess that's a relative word too, so I'm not sure exactly what that means, but 
the World Health Organization has reported that there is evidence of an increased risk of reinfection with Omicron compared to other viruses and that it does seem to be replicating and mutating more quickly. Would that not be a sign of a more serious disease? It could be, it could be. But you know, the thing is, the things change so fast that we shouldn't try to uh, over uh, speculate. I think we have to wait for the data and uh, because most of the time when we predict something, it doesn't come through, you know, because I mean, you have seen so many prediction models that didn't pan out. So I think we should watch this and it's, it's, a, it's good to restrict the, uh, you know, travel, create the travel restrictions. But at the same time, I don't think we need to panic. We need to be very careful and collect data. The key is to collect data. And I think state of Florida is doing a great job collecting data. Um, it, where do we see that data for anyone who wants to follow the data that the state of Florida is collecting? Is there some place that the public, uh, as it used to be with COVID information, is there some place that we can watch on a daily basis what Omicron is is uh, sharing <laughs> with scientists? The data gets released uh, from the state of Florida and also like we have like One World website and the New York Times. Those are two, and Johns Hopkins website, they will pull the data from different sources and put it out. So, so you should be able to track those from, and of course the CDC keeps all the data. Yeah, so everything is filtered into CDC. It, I, I just want to, one more question. Um, the, the reports are saying that Omicron, uh, Omicron has originated in South Africa. I know some of the countries that are in play as COVID names are, are not happy about that, the message that it's sending, and, um, and certainly we respect that. But do you know whether it originated there as well? It's really hard to say, you know, because it all depends on the viruses mutate when there is increased replication. So if there's a high incidence of virus or prevalence of virus in a country, then the, the chance of mutations are greater. So it is possible that South Africa had the first one, but then it's possible that all the other countries, uh, is, you know, who are not vaccinated, uh, who doesn't have that many people vaccinated have this variant. So this is the key that we, I mean, we have this uh, impression that, you know, if we vaccinate our country, we are going to be protected. That is so wrong. We need to vaccinate the entire world. And we all have to work together, the poor countries. If we don't vaccinate the poor countries, these variants will develop there. And it takes only one flight to get these people, uh, viruses back to the developed world. I, I uh, certainly the, I certainly see exactly how that happens. You're so right. And I, I like uh, being able to transmit your message that everyone needs to watch and take heed, but not be scared at the moment. Is that a good read on that? Absolutely. And also, I think we need to put pressure on governments to treat other poor nations and share our vaccines so that they get vaccinated so that they can protect us. It is, you just can't protect ourselves by vaccinating ourselves. We need to protect poor countries so that the, these mutations and these uh, variants would yeah. not come up. Dr. Dushyanta Jayawira, it is so nice to have you on the program. Thank you so much for that information. Appreciate it. Anytime. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye. Take care and stay tuned. We'll be right back. We are online 24-7, so to rewatch today's interviews or listen to the This Week in South Florida podcast, just scan this QR code with your phone. We are so high tech, it takes you right to the This Week in South Florida section of Local10.com. So great to be here with you for this hour. Enjoy the rest of your holiday weekend. 